Then we're going to go to the role of governments in the process, and, and Heather, not surprisingly, is going to talk about that briefly. And what then Paul will discuss uh, the business aspects. Yanis is going to talk about uh, IDNs and their impact, and then Tajani is going to talk about developing economies and the impact of new GTLDs on that. And at each stage, we want this to be as interactive as possible. So please, when we come to the end of a brief presentation, ask questions, make comments, etc. Um, so Akram, do you want to start us rolling with a, an update on where we are and all of that stuff? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so uh, we've uh, we've started the new GTLD program with uh, uh, about 1930 applications. Um, and uh, over the past few months, we've, ha we've actually had a few withdrawals. Uh, the rest of the applications moved forward toward the initial evaluation, and right now we're uh, practically done with the initial evaluation. Uh, the majority of the application passed. There were uh, a handful that didn't, and uh, some, of, uh, some applications went into extended evaluation. Uh, all of the applications that passed the initial evaluation moved forward to uh, basically uh, go into a contracting phase. Uh, in between the contracting and the initial evaluation, there are applications that have objections against them or that have contentions, so more than one application applying for the same strings. Uh, and some of them were held back due to uh, GAC advice to the Board of ICANN. So these applications are now still uh, in the, you know, uh, in the uh, phase where they're sorting out their issues before they can move to contracting. Uh, in the contracting phase, we've signed already uh, over 60 contracts. Uh, and uh, once the contracts were signed, some of these applications moved to what we call pre-delegation pre testing. And out of pre-delegation testing, uh, there are four applications that pass that, and these four applications have moved into delegation right now. So in the next few hours, we expect them to be in the route. The, uh, the four applications that moved forward are uh, all IDNs, uh, which is uh, in, uh, scripts that are different than the Latin script, basically. Uh, and that was one of the goals of the program, is to promote uh, choice and uh, uh, diversity in the t TLD space. The, uh, those applications, uh, one is Arabic, two, uh, uh, two Russian, and one Chinese uh, script. And uh, every, at every phase of the program, every week, the, the program is, uh, reviews the standing of all of the applications that phase and then moves forward according to the priorities that have been assigned. So, uh, so we will see the, f uh, the first few applications will be majority IDNs, but uh, some of them uh, will start trickling in from the, from the Latin script as well, which is the majority of the applications. Uh, we've also uh, managed the issue of collisions that uh, was uh, an issue brought up uh, about the security of the DNS, uh, and we've managed to uh, develop a uh, plan to allow the applications to move forward while mitigating all of the risks of, of the collision. Um, we are also uh, working through the objection processes uh, I know that a lot of, uh, there's a lot of concerns about the uh, string similarities and uh, other issues within the objection processes and uh, uh, all of these are being addressed with the new GTLD program committee of the board of ICANN uh, and uh, we, we will be reviewing all of these decisions and, and deciding how to move forward. The GAC advice, the majority of the GAC advice has been taken by the, uh, accepted by the board, uh, and we are working on implementation of this advice as well. So uh, we believe the program is moving very well, uh, you know, uh, very carefully, but at the same time uh, with uh, expeditiously as well. So, uh, so we, th we think the program is, is being very successful, and we hope to see very uh, many more delegations to happen every week starting next week. Thank you.
So, Akram, could you just explain? So I'm delegated today. What 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 happens then? What's what's next after? I mean, am I immediately can immediately live? What has to happen? Uh, good question, Chris. So, uh, if we uh, when we release somebody with delegation, that means basically we give them a token and we say you've passed all of the requirements of the program. Now you go to the IANA process. Once they go through the IANA process, then the IANA checks their uh, token, checks their uh, information, makes sure that they uh, meet all of the IANA requirements, and then they put them in the route. Once ATLD is in the route, they have to announce their sunrise, and they have to give a 30-day notice for the sunrise period. Once they do that, uh, 30 days later, they can start their sunrise uh, and uh, the sunrise period is another 30 days, during which actually all of the trademark holders that have put their, brand, their uh, marks into the TMCH, uh, the trademark clearing house, can actually register their strings, and nobody else can during that period. So the sunrise is limited to the trademark holders that have uh, put their uh, their uh, marks in, in the TMCH. Once that's done, then the general period opens up and then everybody can start registering in that uh, in the domain. Thank you. So that would mean then if I was in if I was put into the route today, the absolute minimum time that before someone could buy a name in my TLD would be 60 days. 60 days. Okay, cool. Okay. Anyone want to ask any questions about that update on where we are? Don't all rush at once. Okay, well, obviously not, but we'll get back to it. So, Heather, can you talk a little bit about the role the governments have played in the process? Perhaps a bit about the early warning GAC advice, you know, what, what standing that GAC advice has and, and, and how generally how governments are fitted into this into this process. Sure. Okay. So um, the the uh, governmental advisory committee at ICAM uh, plays an advisory role um, to advise on public policy issues that arise as a result of ICAM's coordination role uh, for the names and numbers for the internet. And so a variety of public policy issues uh, do come up, and uh, so the, the, the GAC, as we call it, uh, works on a consensus basis in order to generate uh, uh, inputs and to be very influential on the decision making at ICANN. Because the GTLD program was really quite a broad program in the sense that there were many kinds of top level domains that could or, or perhaps would be applied for. It was really quite a lengthy process to come up with rules and to anticipate the kinds of issues um, or challenges or even sensitivities that could arise uh, with such a, a, a broad undertaking. So naturally, governments had concerns that perhaps some of the top level domains that would be applied for would be controversial or sensitive from a governmental perspective. As a result, uh, the, the GAC at various stages made proposals in order to, to anticipate uh, uh, some of these sensitivities um, arising as a result of applications and uh, identifying ways that, that, that in fact, um, they could be uh, addressed and um, hopefully resolved uh, depending on the nature of uh, the issue. Um, when the GAC first looked at um, these, uh, 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 the kinds of mechanisms or approaches that could be employed, um, there was a lot of discussion about categories. So in other words, if you tried to create categories in advance of inviting the applications, then you could, could identify as well rules to cover each particular kind and perhaps make it easier uh, to, to um, manage um, those issues. Uh, however, um, at the end of uh, a lengthy consultation process uh, with the, the GAC and the board and the community, uh, what was arrived at was a, a process more or less in two phases, although they're, they're not distinct uh, uh, phases. 
um, where the GAC would uh, have a means for, for raising um, uh, sensitivity. So the first was called early warnings. So almost one year ago, uh, uh, individual GAC members, individual governments, were able to raise their concerns via the GAC uh, and issue what were called early warnings to the community. And in total, 242 of these uh, were issued. Um, interestingly, 129 of those were from Australia. Um, so, so Chris, I don't know whether you as an Australian would have a comment on that. Um, but, uh, but nevertheless, um, a variety of concerns were raised. Um, clearly, a number of them uh, uh, <coughs> touched upon uh, geographic uh, or so-called geographic top-level domains. And really, before the application round was opened, there was good reason to believe that these would be sensitive because um, whenever this issue has come up, um, it's been clear that, that governments uh, uh, do have, as they see it, um, a, a considerable interest in how geographic terms are, in fact, treated as part of a process like this. So the idea is that if you issue an early warning uh, to the community and to the applicant in particular, that you create an opportunity for the parties to resolve uh, their differences and uh, hopefully in such a way that there are no further uh, issues with that application proceeding, at least from the perspective of that government. And certainly the GAC would not have uh, a further view uh, to consider on those. Um, and I think in a number of instances, this proved to be quite successful. And uh, there was a, a good faith effort on, on the part of, of governments issuing the early warnings and those receiving them to try and resolve um, those issues. However, of course, not all issues can be resolved. And in anticipation of that, um, there was uh, the possibility outlined uh, in advance um, for, for another kind of mechanism um, called GAC advice, specifically um, GAC objections. So if there is a, an application, if there is a string where a, a, uh, a government still has a, a concern, and the early wor warnings really prove to be a good guide for, for what could be a concern later on, then uh, it's possible for um, those governments to come to the GAC as a whole and to, to, to raise their concerns with the committee and uh, to perhaps raise their early warning to, to the level of the GAC. And if uh, it's the case that other colleagues and other governments in the GAC did not, did not want to stand in the way of those consensus objections, then in fact the GAC would successfully um, issue consensus objections. So, um, so this, this has happened in a number of cases. Um, there are a few uh, strings that remain on the GAC's agenda for discussion, but for the most part, the GAC has worked its way through most of the applications, most of the strings, and uh, most of the issues that, that have arisen. So for the most part, you can say this was very successful. Uh, we have found, of course, that um, there were uh, a few areas where perhaps we, we didn't fully anticipate certain issues to come up, um, and perhaps in the future we might actually refine um, these processes. Um, and uh, that's something that uh, we will need to think about in, in the future, particularly if there are future rounds uh, for uh, new GTLDs. Um, so I think uh, in, in, in carrying uh, out these mechanisms, it was an, uh, an important test for the GAC, um, but one that, that does have its challenges. And uh, as a result of that, we do have uh, a few more issues that, that remain on our, our agenda. But um, clearly, geographical terms are sensitive for governments. Um, uh, but it does help to have rules laid out in advance. Uh, uh, and uh, in some ways, I think it's been hard uh, once, once the, the nature of the applications have been seen to, to perhaps keep as closely uh, to those, those rules and processes as um, it, it, it would have been um, if uh, perhaps uh, the, the issues were, were better understood uh, beforehand. Um, so uh, perhaps I can, I can stop here and, and we can talk a bit more about um,
some of that if there's interest in further discussion. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, just kind of raise your hand or make a comment. And I think it's important that, that I mean, that, that this has kind of been a coming of age experience for the for the GAC in the sense that it's a real, really hard kind of nutty, nutty government issues to be dealt with. And it's the, it's the, it's my personal view, it's probably the first time that the GAC has really, really, really had to deal with real life make or break, this makes a huge difference type stuff. In the sense of, of stopping things from happening, Triple X was the first said yes. Well, well actually, go on Yanis, you, you were there, you talk about that. So you should, that'll teach you. Go to, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'd be interested in hearing what you had to say because of the, uh, you have nothing to say, okay. You would, Heather, however, have something to say. Go ahead, Heather. Um, I, th I think it's, it's uh, helpful for you to raise this example because, in fact, the experience with Dot Triple X really was the, the first example of a, a controversial top level domain being uh, 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 discussed uh, at some length uh, within the, the ICANN processes. And that was the example that GAC members were referring to when trying to lay out the processes and put put detail to um, these mechanisms that I've described, and uh, and and you know I, I think that uh, it's really the, the the most important case for for dealing with um, um, such issues. Thank you, Jim. Uh, hi, Jim Prendergast, the Galway Strategy Group. Um, I've been working with several applicants, uh, some of which were the subject of uh, early warnings. And I would say that I thought that program worked really well. Uh, it gave an opportunity for governments and applicants to discuss issues, resolve them in a timely manner, and then be able to move on. So I think it's definitely something I thought that worked very well in the program. Thank you. And a gentleman at the back there who I can't quite see. Yes, go ahead, sir. Uh, hi, I'm D Dave Moskowitz from Internet New Zealand. Uh, Heather, you mentioned uh, geographic names as being an area of particular sensitivity. Uh, what were the other sort of classes of, of, of names where, where you experienced the most conflict? Uh, so I'll, I'll try to recall um, uh, from the top of my mind, uh, but uh, that there certainly were sensitivities with, with some uh, terms that, that were religious, and, um, and then they have an additional layer of sensitivity to them. Um, because some uh, uh, really um, uh, are not supportive of governments commenting on matters related to religion. So that was um, uh, interesting for, for the GAC to handle. Um, and there are of, often uh, ge geopolitical uh, issues associated with those in addition um, as well. Um, we, we uh, uh, let's think, um, we had, uh, Ah uh, yes, you're reminding me about safeguards. Thank you, Akram. Um, so the GAC uh, as well uh, came up with various sets of what we were calling safeguards, and um, that was to deal with, uh, among other things, um, uh, top-level domains that were applied for that represented a regulated market. Uh, so if you can imagine uh, uh, applications for for uh, uh, top of domains related to the financial industry, banking, those sorts of activities, then you would you would uh, have a, an enhanced concern from a consumer protection point of view. Um, and so it was believed uh, within the GAC that a particular uh, requirement should be placed on those applicants given the associated risks with, with operating a top level domain like that. So. Um, so, so there, there are quite a few safeguards that we came up with to deal with, with various problems. Um, it closed uh, uh, or exclusive access was also an issue. So if you applied for a generic term that was uh, representing an industry and, and was perhaps closely associated with the kind of business you were and you were proposing um, to not allow others to register in that top level domain, um, it was viewed as, as being, uh, uh, there being potential for anti-competitive type activity or for it to not really be in the interest of uh, users um, using those top level domains. So. Thanks, Heather. Well, let's move on to Paul. If you could, Paul, just address, address it from the applicant's uh, side and, uh, and I guess also a brand applicant as opposed to just a sort of general GTLD applicant. Sure. 
So um, Microsoft is kind of interesting in that as this whole process was going along, um, we were also in the beginning stages of redefining the direction the company was moving. So uh, if you go back four or five years, it was very clear we were a company that did, that created um, a variety of software products um, for enterprises and consumers and a well-known operating system called Windows. And many of those products, you know, talked on the internet and worked on the internet, but we hadn't come around to our sort of integrated devices and services strategy all up until basically this year. The one exception to that was the Xbox. So those of you who are familiar with Xbox know that its distinguishing feature when the product was launched in 2000 was the fact that it had the capability to have a, a network uh, of connected gameplay. So with that as, as the backdrop, and being a company of 100,000 people that operates in 140 countries and, and is essentially has fully distributed businesses, our challenge was, what is our strategy for this new domain thing? We obviously have to think about it, um, but the question was, who gets to think about it? Because the way our businesses were aligned is we had the Office business, the Windows business, the Xbox business, the phone business, a few other things that were all businesses. And we don't have and did not have um, sort of a central bureaucratic planning organization. So Microsoft um, did what we usually do, which was we create a virtual team that tries to look at the issue and come up with a strategy. And we we decided that there were really a couple of strategies that we could pursue. Um, one strategy was the category strategy. Let's just think of all the things that could be categories and see if we could get a top-level domain for that category, you know, cats, dogs, pets, whatever. Um, no, we had no clue what the business might be if we did that, but we thought that was a, that was a strategy. Uh, and the flip side strategy was, well, we have, we have our brands, our big brands, and we have communities of users that are built around those brands to more or less extent. So that the, you know, the classic one is obviously Xbox, the live community there, but we have a variety of other communities across the other brands. And so uh, as we thought about it, we, we thought what we really should do is go with a brand strategy. The brands are strong and, and and they have community associations. Now, how do we actually do that? Um, well, one of our challenges is that some of our brands are just generic words, uh, Windows, for example, or Office. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we put together our RV team and cycled this around the company, uh, around the various geographies, and ultimately got to, to the point where, where we applied for uh, 411 uh, top-level domains, which are basically the the top Microsoft brands. And uh, as we did that, there's several things that, uh, that were notable to us as part of the process and important to us as, a, as an owner of valuable brands. Uh, one of them, probably the, the most important, was the recognition that the brands themselves had value, their intellectual property value, uh, and and the necessary uh, protections and to have the necessary protections in place so that the brands, our brands, couldn't be abused by others. Uh, we have had the, the history of having early on in, in, uh, in, in previous um, domain registration periods, we've had our brands um, misrepresented and, and, uh, and learned a lot about uh, how to manage ourselves on the Internet uh, addressing that, so the fact that the brand protections um, were in fact part of the process uh, that ICANN had, and, um, had come up with uh, was very important to us. Um, and we, if, for those of you who follow all the comment periods, uh, we have been quite vocal along the way as to ways to strengthen those processes, uh, how those processes should operate, um, uh, you know, across the board. But I think, you know, the message I would leave you with uh, on, on this front, and then we can talk um, later in Q&A, I guess, is wherever you want to go with this, but is that um, from, from the perspective of a brand owner, the critical thing for us was the ability to 
strengthen and protect the brand uh, and be able to leverage it in and control its meaning the same way we can in print in you know other kinds of media on product packaging and to be able to to build out the extension uh, in, a, in a way, if you think about what's happening in media, completely separate from the Internet, we used to have television shows that ran on TV at a time slot, and that was it. Now we have complete media experiences, like Game of Thrones and things like that, that transcend all, all types of media, from video to the online property to um, the tchotchkes that you can buy to, to books. And all of those things, the sort of complete brand management is part of what happens in media. In this context, we're looking to this entire process to be able to extend our own management of our own brands directly to, to the community. Now, the last thing I'll say about that is that I mentioned at the beginning that we're in this middle of this transition from being this sort of vertical um, individual businesses to being a devices and services company in which the thing that we sell is this integration between the service and whatever device you're using it on, whether it's a PC, a tablet, a phone, or a television set, game console. And that, that creates an entirely new category of necessary marketing and, and, um, and attachment and affinity building. And that's sort of the critical element that we're looking to um, with the strategy we're pursuing. Okay. I'm thinking we might just hold questions and comments for the moment and go let, let Janice and Tajani have their, their say and then we'll come back to questions and comments. So Janice, do you want to tackle the uh, IDN mountain? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, speaking about uh, IDNs or, or talk about IDNs uh, at ICANN started with the uh, uh, implementation of uh, IDN CCTLD fast track program and uh, of course now after three years after the launch of the first for more than three years now it will be five years after the launch of the first um, ID and CCTLD strings we can uh, really start uh, drawing first lessons uh, from that experience because um, we uh, certainly uh, have not devi de deviated from understanding uh, or premise that uh, IDNs uh, is something uh, very good, which is meant to promote uh, a use of uh, different languages uh, on the net and uh, allows potentially join the uh, uh, network citizenry those who do not master any language uh, using uh, Latin script. Because, of course, uh, we, we most probably uh, think that uh, everybody on this planet uh, master in one way or another Latin script. But believe me, there are millions and billions of people for whom Latin script is exactly the same as for us Chinese uh, characters. So, uh, therefore, the value of I IDNs in general is to bring uh, to the... Um, uh, to the internet, those who are not able to use uh, uh, Latin Latin script, uh, on top of strengthening uh, emotional affiliation of those who master different languages uh, to the use of their uh, mother tongue uh, on on the net. Uh, Together, uh, in order to understand what, is, uh, what are the consequences or first lessons of uh, introduction of IDNs, uh, uh, together with the URID, uh, we uh, are third year in a row making analysis of the uptake uh, of uh, uh, IDNs in CCTLD space. And uh, uh, URID uh, publishes a world report uh, with support of UNESCO and uh, this year also uh, VeriSign, where this anal analysis is uh, uh, made and um, uh, which is, this analysis is based on uh, examples. Uh, last year, a rather small uh, set of uh, domain names 
uh, this year we, we were lucky to access data and this is done on the basis of a very large um, uh, number of uh, domain names. Uh, I would uh, be not willing to go into very detailed explanation uh, on the conclusions. I would rather invite you to uh, come tomorrow at 11 uh, to uh, listen to the uh, presentation of the 2013 World Report and might be an uptake. Uh, nevertheless, I uh, will maybe disclose a few features uh, which uh, I think uh, are important. Uh, we uh, analyzing uh, IBM CCTLD uptake last year, uh, we came to conclusion that there are two uh, group of issues. One group of issue relates to um, organization or organizational aspects, meaning uh, registration awareness or registration policies awareness. And another group of issues um, is linked to uh, technical aspects uh, and uh, user experience. Uh, speaking about the uh, first group of, of issues, uh, it was uh, very clear uh, that um, uptake of ID and CCTLDs were very much related to the uh, liberalization of registration policies. And we saw that in countries like, for instance, Russia, where uh, registration policies um, are uh, liberal, the uh, hype around uh, this uh, uh, first introduction was very high and there was a really exponential uh, growth of uh, IBN uh, CCTLD registration in domain .rf in Cyrillic. Uh, in other countries where registration policies were much more uh, uh, restrictive, we saw, we did not see this hype and we saw very kind of uh, limited and not very big um, uptake uh, in registration. Uh, this year, apart from registration policies, which uh, were addressed in, in the uh, last year's report, we identified that uh, public awareness uh, is uh, not sufficient. And, and that also explains that there is no uh, a bigger number of registration. If we're speaking in uh, relative terms, uh, today, IDNs in all forms, not only IDNs.IDNs, but uh, IDNs.ASCII, uh, represent uh, about 2% of all uh, domain names. Uh, and that is certainly not, not enough, but the number is growing. And we, we believe that with um, uh, now with the launch of first uh, generic IDN names, uh, this number will be uh, steadily growing. On the other side, uh, the questions uh, re uh, were related to uh, user experience and uh, technical uh, issues. And uh, what we discovered uh, that one of the main obstacle from user uh, experience uh, point of view was lack of email service in IDNs. Uh, IETF in 2000, um, I think it was 11, or, or maybe early 12, uh, adopted IDN email protocol. But that IDN email protocol is not yet fully embraced by all service providers. And uh, uh, the first email, a uh, fully IDN email, uh, was sent uh, uh, in 2012 uh, using this IETF uh, protocol. Uh, of course, we, we hope that uh, this protocol will be widely applied uh, in uh, all different services. Uh, what, what, what are other elements of this negative experience? Even if, for instance, in one case, uh, IDN email went out from the sender, it uh, did not necessarily arrive to a recipient. And of course, with such a negative experience, uh, people uh, did not feel very uh, comfortable and the hype of registration uh, went down because of this negative experience. As well, other elements that uh, the majority 
uh, of um, uh, uh, popular browsers uh, do not uh, master fully IDNs, and uh, you cannot uh, uh, use I IDN URLs, and, and uh, uh, there are te technical issues uh, related to that. Uh, if uh, in this year we saw improvement in um, uh, services related to uh, to normal uh, applications. When, when it comes to mobile applications, the situation is still unsatisfactory, and um, so the, the, their movement in using IBNs uh, hasn't really started yet. And as a, as a result, um, we we see that there is a kind of a vicious vicious circle where where um, the negative uh, or, or poor uh, user experience lead to uh, low user uh, uptake in, in IDNs. Uh, low user uptake uh, does not generate sufficient uh, hype around it. So at, that leads in uh, low user awareness. Uh, low user awareness, again, uh, comes to low uptake. And that is so we need to really to break uh, this uh, vicious circle uh, by um, most probably giving sufficient uh, user experience and uh, putting emphasis on both, of course, sides, uh, uh, the technical side and um, uh, registration side or organizational side. Uh, this year, based on previous year's um, IBN uptake uh, report, Director General of UNESCO uh, made a public statement where uh, she congratulated technical community for the work which uh, has been done so far in um, uh, uh, making use of IDNs uh, possible uh, in cyberspace and uh, challenged them to uh, uh, continue working in that. And uh, as we in Latvia say, we overstepped the dog. Now we need to overstep the tail. So really to uh, fix those uh, few uh, remaining technical issues specifically related to uh, user experience, uh, that that could allow uh, everybody who uh, does not have ASCII uh, character uh, keyboard uh, fully embrace all, all the benefits of IDN as they were planned. So uh, for more details and maybe uh, more technical details, please uh, come tomorrow at 11 uh, in room 5, uh, where the 2013 uh, World Report on IDN Uptake will be presented, and with the, of course, with a uh, more detailed uh, presentation that I did uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. We'll, we'll hear from Tajani, and then we'll take uh, comments and questions from the floor on any aspect of new GTLDs at all, Tajani. Thank you, Chris. So you asked me what is the impact of the new GTLD program on the developing economies and the poor um, uh, communities. Let me first uh, explain you what happened. Since the first draft of the applicant guidebook, a big concern was raised by the community about the application cost. I can say that uh, uh, it wants to recover money that uh, uh, was spent on this program and the community say you are excluding developing economies and poor communities. This fight, advocacy, um, um, uh, lobbying continued like this till Nairobi where the board adopted the resolution 20 asking the community to form a working group to see how uh, uh, we can uh, um, assist needy applicants uh, to uh, apply for and to operate a new GTLD. So this is one aspect. A second aspect is that the new GTLD program wasn't promoted and wasn't advertised for uh, uh, in the uh, developing economies regions. It was done for uh, the, the north, but not in the south. While in the north, they didn't need it a lot, 
and in the south it was uh, necessary it was compulsory if you don't don't do it people will not know about it so the working group was formed and the just working group and uh, working for two years very hard work and issuing the final report and then a support program for the applicants was adopted by ICANN and ICANN uh, created a fund of two million dollars which is very good which is something uh, a very positive result those two million dollars was uh, uh, able to help till 14 applicants but uh, when we wrote the recommendations of the just working group we uh, was very tough in defining the criteria the eligibility criteria for this for this support because we didn't want the system to be gamed the result of all this is that those tough criteria uh, uh, um, didn't didn't let people apply under the the applicant support program because if you apply under this program and uh, you don't meet the criteria you will be excluded totally excluded from the program you don't you are not able to apply as a normal applicant so this is uh, one element that make uh, um, uh, let's say needy applicants don't apply under this uh, uh, applicant support program so a lot of elements made that the um, uh, applicants from the um, developing economies and from poor communities didn't apply the result was there over 1930 application received less than 1% came from Africa and only 1.25% came from Latin America and Caribbean region so what is the impact of this program on this, uh, those regions almost nothing moreover when the applicant support program was applied was uh, uh, implemented only three applicants applied for it and um, after evaluation only one was supported while we had money for 14 so I am afraid that um, the, the developing economies and the poor communities didn't benefit from this program at all and I hope that for the upcoming grants if there is upcoming grants uh, the things will uh, will change and um, uh, uh, we have to look to this um, uh, app applicant support program in another way we have to put other criteria that are that that will um, permit um, um, better result for this program and also very important I can should make a lot of outreach in the uh, poor regions for the, uh, the upcoming rounds of the new GTLD program thank you thank you so we're going to take some questions from the floor JC you had your hand up earlier on and the gentleman behind is next so Jean-Christophe you're first uh, would, it, would it be true um, my name is uh, Mujuru, Tichafa Mujuru and I'm from Zimbabwe no. so would it be true uh, to say that um, the new GLTD uh, the new GTLD I mean uh, program was not uh, well publicized uh, in the developing uh, communities would it be true to say that so you're asking if you you're asking whether it was it would be true to say that the new GTLD program wasn't advertised in the developing world um, Akram so uh, the new GTLD program had a uh, campaign for uh, uh, outreach and uh, and uh, to let as many people in the developing 
I want to rephrase that, as many organizations or companies in the developing uh, world uh, know about the program, but the world is pretty large. So uh, to actually say that we've uh, covered everywhere, I, I, I cannot say that. But I think that uh, we uh, we've had a lot of reach. Uh, some areas more than others. We've received over a uh, uh, hundred IDNs, which is actually a measure of uh, uh, not the total. Uh, registrations that are uh, or applications that came from the uh, globally, but uh, specifically registrations with a uh, foreign uh, with a different script than the Latin script. Uh, so we've had a uh, you know a few from uh, Africa, a few from uh, Latin America, a, a lot more from Asia. Um, so so we've we've had a global. Uh, uh, uptake of the program, uh, and and I think that actually the best advertisement is going to be the, when this round goes live. That's when everybody's going to be aware of the new GDLD program. That's when everybody's going to know that there, that that there is this uh, opportunity to register at the root level, uh, and uh, that will be the benefit of uh, this round for the next round when it happens. Thank you. Thank you, Akram. I'm going to come to you in a second, Jean-Christophe, one, one sec. So, but I want to ask on this, because this is on the point we're talking about. So, Tijani, I want to put a proposition to you. Um, what would you say to the argument that um, there, it, 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 it's actually been a success in the developing world, as Akram said, in, in the sense that we now have not just CCTLD IDNs, but GTLD IDNs, opening up the marketplace for those who are accessing the internet usually by way of mobile device rather than by computer are now able to do so in a manner that they can, they can, they can understand. And that the concept of having um, actual GTLDs themselves um, may have been sort of too much to bite off too soon and you have to build more slowly with your capacity building rather than trying to take a large bite out of the out of the cake, if you like, immediately. Um, before uh, answering your question, uh, I am afraid I will uh, disagree with my friend uh, Akram. Because um, uh, the outreach campaign was mostly done in a developed world. And at the end, they told us that the, uh, the, the campaign will be online using social media, etc. Knowing that uh, uh, people who are the most connected are people from the north. So it, I think for the south, you need uh, human presence and you, you, you need um, a real uh, event with a lot of noise so that people can know that there is something perhaps interesting for their business. Now, coming back to, the, to your question, yes, you are right. I, I agree with you. but. I think that we lost also another opportunity for the first round and it could be better done, I am sure it could be better done if uh, the, the, the outreach was done in the, in the right way and also if our criteria wasn't done in this way so that we lost up to 13 uh, support for applicants. Thank you. Fair enough. Thank you. So now, JC, over to you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, good afternoon. Jean-Christophe Vigne from Dot Secure. The question is for the gentleman at Microsoft. I'm sorry I didn't remember your name. Uh, in a previous live, to use Chris's expression, I was involved with helping companies getting new GTLEs, and I want to tell you that it's very refreshing to hear a company with an actual plan as opposed to we registered because we could or because we had to uh, for defensive reasons. So first of all, congratulations for that, sir. But the, the other question is, given that you had a whole team working on it and that you seem to have a very clear way of doing things, um, and without, of course, going into details, I would say, how ready are you? And basically, are you waiting for, uh, well, the, the great day that we had yesterday where some TLDs were actually in the route to push the button and then the Microsoft users would be able to use the TLDs as quickly as possible? Or is it still something that you need to think about? And, I mean, 
Okay, well, thanks for the question. Um, so the engineering activity um, has been moving along in terms of what we have to do uh, in order to be able to operate a registry and and do that do that well and be ready for delegation. So all of that work is going on and uh, and as far as I'm aware as of today it's more or less on schedule without a lot of hiccups. Uh, I think the question actually raises a broader issue which I think applies to everyone who's getting new top-level domains and anyone who then registers in inside them which is how do the end users out there, the netizens, actually uh, come across these things, right? Uh, there's, there's more to it than just getting the domain, at least from, from our perspective, just getting the domain and, and pushing a button. The, the reality is that um, we need a strategy for communicating what these new domains are, why they exist, why they're beneficial, to whatever the particular purpose might be for Xbox or whatever. Um, and, and then there's other engineering work that has to go on in the, in the browsers and the search engines that um, help people figure out where to go. So, you know, the, today browsers prepend three W's and typically will iterate through .edu, .com, .whatever. Uh, the, the things that are there if you just enter a word, right? Um, well, now we're going to have several more of those. Not, I mean, not just the Microsoft one. There's a lot. So uh, I think it's fair to say we don't really know how we're going to deal with that from from the browser perspective yet. Or from, from uh, an even more interesting perspective is that we're now increasingly in an app world uh, on mobile devices that where all those uh, URLs actually still have meaning, and they're they're there. They're part of the ecosystem, but they're they're approached in a different way. They're they're you know the the access to them is handled differently. We haven't thought through all of those uh, those implications yet. Uh, so I guess I, it's it's saying um, on the registry side, we'll we'll be pretty ready pretty soon. To, to do things on the, uh, is the rest of the ecosystem ready? And are we ready to figure out how to communicate globally what these all are? That's a, that's a lot of work that still has to be done. Uh, and I think, um, I think that's broadly the case for the, the community as a whole. I think that's probably true. I mean, from an Australian perspective, I can tell you that um, we've got um, where we think that it's the, the brand uh, TLDs that will educate the public that these things even exist. We think it's highly unlikely that, no offence to anybody involved in dot shop, it's just the first one that springs to mind, that, that dot shop is going to be uh, pretty big in Australia anytime soon. But we think that the Australian public will certainly know about the banks, the three, three of our top four banks have applied for their own um, string. Uh, probably dot Sydney and dot Melbourne, uh, and, and, and that will and, and dot Australian AFL, which is the Australian Football League, which anyone who knows Australia will know that Australians are mad about sport. Um, so that's those sorts of things are going to educate people, and then it's a question of whether, as you say, whether we might find ourselves with such a lag that, that the early adopters, the technology hasn't caught up with the early adopters. I mean, that's a yeah. I mean, I th think part of the part of the challenge with these is to um, Teach people what the value is and what and and what they mean. And I, I mean I mean the the netizens rather than you know like what's the difference between going to something dot Microsoft or Microsoft dot com as an example, right? Um, that if, if there is no def, definite difference, if we can't create a difference in value somehow or other, then one ends up being a substitution for the other, and we haven't done anything significant, right? It's pretty clear if you look at, if you say Xbox, because um, that's a nice easy community to, to look at. There's millions of accounts globally that really identify with themselves as a unique community within the internet itself. So we could do lots of things with that, with that from the perspective that, um, but that 
is an identifiable community, and Xbox itself means very specific things to that community. Um, Windows is a different animal, right? Windows, for a lot of people, is this generic thing that just runs everywhere, like it or not, right? Uh, and, and so for us, uh, figuring out how to communicate the unique value proposition to the end users of whatever the domain is that we're, that we're operating um, is, just a, is just a critical thing. Uh, and, and I think for the entire um, GTLD uh, ecosystem to be successful, those of us who are applying for domains and, and ultimately launching them uh, really need to think through and be very careful how we do that so that when they're launched, they are meaningful and uh, and and uh, and deliver that value. Otherwise, you know, it will it will do Giannis's uh, you know the descending spiral thing, which we don't want to see. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jim Prendergast. Akram, I'm going to ask the question, but I'm pretty sure I know the answer you're going to give. But I think the answer is beneficial for others in the audience and for the record. Uh, we've already heard about round two coming. Round one being a good advertising launch for future rounds. Can you give an estimate on when we might see a round two opening? Tomorrow? Monday. <laughs> yes, sorry, Monday. We're still here tomorrow. So, so let's first uh, agree that it's not my decision on when there is a second round. Uh, it is actually a community's decision. Uh, but there are a few things that we need to do. I think that we need to wait for the first few delegations to be in the route for about a year do some assessment and understand how uh, successful they were. Uh, and based on that, I think we can uh, start talking about the second round. So I don't foresee something to happen before a couple of years from now. Uh, but uh, I think there will be some pressure uh, once uh, some of the corporate brands, for example, see that their competitors have a route and if that actually starts coming out, we're going to start getting pressure from the other corporates that didn't uh, uh, didn't participate in the program uh, to to open up for a second round. Also, I think the other pressure will come from uh, IDNs. If the demand is there, then we're going to start seeing some pressure there. I think that the generics were, you know, most of the names were already applied for. So I don't know how many generics we need in the uh, Latin script, but uh, we'll see that happen in the next few months. And, and I was just about to ask you, Heather, because I suspect you're, you're the, I know the GAC has a view on some stuff that needs to happen before we go to round two. Uh, th thank you, yes. So um, uh, Akram mentioned uh, some of the, the areas of interest that, that may be out there um, that we'll see uh, a second round. But to come back to our earlier discussion, um, uh, governments and, and the GAC have been very clear that uh, they would like to see uh, increased uptake from developing countries and for them to, to take advantage. And um, we also need to look at what worked well in this program and, and maybe what worked less well. And so there needs to be at least a, enough time to, to learn those lessons and, and maybe recalibrate uh, some of, of the, the, the rules or approaches that were undertaken this time around in order to, to uh, enable um, uh, things to perhaps go a bit more smoothly or at least to, to get those kinds of, of results that, that uh, we're, we're looking for. Um, I think uh, it would be beneficial to, to have clear objectives uh, advance uh, in advance as a community at ICANN. Um, I, I'm not entirely convinced that um, that uh, with the round that that we're we're now uh, in process with that there really was uh, uh, a solid shared understanding about what would be the the objectives for the program, um, allowing us to determine what would make it successful. Uh, and so, of course, if if you're going to undertake a round again. Um, you are going to want to see communities of users. You do want to see uh, encouragement of, of language groups, social groups, cultural groups, um, these kinds of things. Um, that's not to say that um, um, there's, there's any uh, uh, difficulty with, with uh, uh, coming at it from a business perspective. And um, frankly, the, the brand top-level domains are probably the most straightforward kind of, of application that there is. You mean is. like .amazon? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. 
Um, but if you look at trademark protections and, and some of the, the issues that were associated with um, um, uh, the generics, generally speaking, um, you, you can, uh, I think, probably avoid many of those uh, when it comes to considering a, a brand application. So. And, and I'm going to ask Tajani to comment in a second, but I, I also think it's important. We're, we're kind of assuming, to some extent, that, that, the, that the brand applications are going, to encu are going to create pressure for other brands. I mean, it, it's entirely possible that this whole thing may actually turn out to not do that at all, and that in fact, brands may be saying in the year's time, I, I'm not entirely sure why I bothered. Uh, it's, it's hard to know, I'm, I'm very hard to know. Tajani? <coughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, following on what was said about uh, a second round, um, uh, inside the, the at-large musical um, working group, we was thinking about uh, remediations of the actual situation regarding the, um, uh, the um, um, involvement of the um, uh, developing economies and the poor communities in the MUGTLD program in, in the first round. And, uh, one of the uh, possible solutions was that uh, we propose to organize a dedicated round for the development economies and the poor uh, communities with uh, certain limitations so that uh, uh, the situation will be improved. I want to say that the most interesting strings are already uh, took during this first round. And this is a big harm for the developing economies. So, so that they can perhaps um, have better chance to have their, their TLDs, uh, uh, perhaps an educated uh, uh, round will be good. Thank you. Does anybody else want to, on the panel want to comment? Paul? Well, so I, I, I think the exuberance around the uh, GTLD program and wanting to go to a, to a second round is, on the one hand, really great because it's, it's sort of pushing the innovation button, and I think that's always, always important. On the other hand, uh, I think when I, when I think about the engineering issues and the, scale, the scaling issues, uh, I think we would be counseling something more like, you know, four plus years before uh, going to another round. That is long enough so that we will have gone through, as an industry, at least a couple of iterations of new browsers, having taken into account and solved these problems, that we will have stabilized the impacts on the on the DNS and the and the route from all of the delegations that are going to be happening. And that we will have had a, a substantial, substantive period of stability in the new environment. A substantive means a couple of years, which really isn't all that long, but uh, and, but it is fairly long in internet time, uh, where we could really, as a as a community, judge the the technical issues because there will be some. We we know that. Um, and judge the economic issues and judge the user uptake and then be able to make um, adaptations to the program for the second round. So I, I would just um, offer that that uh, that I think you know we might as a community be wise to think about it that way. The, the exception I think to that would be uh, to do something to stimulate a little bit more of the IDNs, which I think is in, in line with uh, both of of the comments on either side of me, um, we were actually surprised uh, to see the relatively low number of IDN applications in the in the overall pool. Um, you know, we were thinking, perhaps naively, that that would have been uh, you know, a large batch that because finally it's opened up, and and I think that that's an area where you could stimulate just around for IDNs. Um, and 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 figure out how to how to uh, build the pool that way. But I guess we'll see what happens. I guess we will. Anyone else got anything that they would like to comment on or ask about the new GTLD program? Because otherwise, I'll go for a final round of comments from the panel if there are any, and then we can go have a beer for those who drink beer. 
Olivier, I knew you couldn't resist. Thanks very much, Chris. Olivier crepin uh, elect chair. Uh, I was just going to add uh, uh, one more comment, uh, which is that uh, ICANN is uh, currently putting together a set of metrics uh, in order to uh, monitor the development and the, the rollout of those new GTLDs and to find out whether they uh, are uh, going to uh, uh, effectively uh, make the internet space better, uh, whether they're going to serve the public interest. And, and so this is a very interesting, very important program that is being rolled out. And I guess that uh, some of the answers as to when the next uh, round will take place and uh, how successful is this program going to be, um, these questions are going to be probably partially answered, at least, um, by this uh, continued monitoring uh, that ICANN will be putting uh, together. And I thought that's a, it's particularly important uh, to recognize that. Thank you. Thanks, Olivier. And I think, I mean, it's interesting that we've heard, we've heard this afternoon, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say consensus, but we've heard a, 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 a level of understanding that it may well be that a round two doesn't necessarily mean a big round two. It could just mean let's talk about what we can put into round two that needs to be done, such as more IDNs and more developing economy uh, TLDs. Does anyone want to have a last crack at a, a comment? Akram? So I, I just want to say that uh, uh, there, is, there is a fact that the internet is global and when we talk about scripts and IDNs, they're local. So, uh, so that might be the reason why we didn't see the uptick that uh, everybody expect, everybody expects. Because if I'm an organization, I want to be on the internet and I want to reach globally, then I'm not going to be able to use a script that's not global. So, uh, so the, until these economies actually become locally much stronger, it might be uh, hard to stimulate IDN demand. Um, having said that, I think this this launch is going to be the measure of the demand, how much demand there is for IDNs. They're going to know about the program, they're going to know about the, ab the ability of getting IDNs, and I think that's going to help us measure the next step. So, looking forward to all the innovations on, the, on that space. <laughs> Agreed. Yanis, you had your, your hand up to comment, and then I'll go to Heather. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, local or not so local, if you, if you take uh, spread, for instance, of uh, people speaking Chinese uh, in the world, I, I think it's uh, fair, fairly global. Uh, the thing is, in, in uh, some countries, Chinese speaking uh, uh, Internet users uh, master ASCII, and they are, there is no really big demand uh, for, for IDNs. But, uh, it, it is absolutely uh, clear and evident that uh, IDNs is uh, a way of expression of the uh, national identity or et ethnical identity. And uh, there is a very strong emotional affiliation uh, to that. And um, uh, therefore, uh, as soon as user experience will uh, be satisfactory, I suspect that that will drive a lot of or create a lot of hype around the uh, IDNs. Heather? Um, thank you. I just wanted to conclude with, with uh, an observation that um, uh, we talked a bit about um, the, the GAC and the importance of, of these mechanisms um, being used for the first time. So there really was an element of it being experimental for the GAC um, to, to issue early warnings like this and, and to be able to issue consensus objections and um, to, to be so suasive um, in terms of the applications that, that were made. Um, and, uh, and this really uh, meant that governments were part of the process in a way that they have not been before. And um, you know, we've, we've had uh, a vast array of issues arise because of, of um, the, the, the various uh, applications and various kinds of applications uh, that have been made. And this has meant the GAC has had to deal with, with all kinds of issues um, that, that may be dealt with um, in, in other organizations, uh, 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 expert organizations. Um, so that's been 
um, this, this, this test and has really drawn out um, what is most interesting about um, the committee within uh, ICANN, within the ICANN model, and that is the interaction of, of these uh, uh, entities that are, are sovereign entities uh, sending representatives to a committee um, that is, is part of, of uh, the ICANN framework and, and how such a political process is interacting with a decision-making process that, that needs to have uh, some degree of, of predictability, follow some rules, uh, and, and result in, in decision-making at the end that uh, uh, is, is sound. Um, and uh, I think it, it has been uh, fascinating so far, and, and we're not quite uh, uh, there yet. Uh, we, we do have um, some decisions still pending um, and, and issues remaining uh, in, in the GAC on that, but uh, you know, it's, it's already clear to me that, um, that, uh, that, that tension is, is, is really uh, an interesting one to, to look at about how these things work. And in fact, there, there isn't um, always shared expectations about what, what that interaction looks like between uh, governments and, and uh, the other communities that I can, uh, whether it's business, whether it's, it's the board, whether you know, it's um, a civil society. So um, I just wanted to, to point that out because I think it's, it's really a, 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 a broad significance, what's, what's been going on. Thanks, Heather. Tushani? Thank you. I'd like to add something about the IDN and why the demand on the IDN is not so big. I think that um, uh, for the business, for people interested in the business, uh, they uh, they want to, to remain in the ASCII uh, um, uh, strings because they, they want to sell their, uh, their goods everywhere in the world. Even if there is half of the world speaking China, Chinese, uh, Chinese businessmen wants to sell them, uh, their goods not only for Chinese but for the other uh, people. And uh, since the, um, the I have to say, English is better understood than Chinese, for the whole world, they will remain with uh, ASCII, I think. And uh, we've, we did the experience in Tunisia. Our ideal CTLD now, it is almost not used. People are not asking for it. Only people interested in culture and linguistic issues, they ask for Arabic.tn. The, the business uh, community are not interested in it. Thank you. So I don't particularly consider myself old, but when I was going to school, none of this stuff existed. And, and so here we are, and we are on top of a global platform that is you know, responsible for huge economic uplift around the world. And if we uh, do our jobs correctly, that, that uplift really moves into developing countries and helps them. It helps the developed come countries and it brings us all closer together. One of the challenges that we face when we do something as, as innovative and disruptive as the, this new program is we risk destabilizing um, things that, that are now fundamental requirements of, of our developed societies. Uh, I think it is a testament to the system as a whole that uh, this process, which has gone on for seven or eight years trying to figure it out, um, with lots of commentary, uh, of, with various political and uh, emotional tonality, depending on where you are on various issues, it's a testament to the system that we've got this far and things are working reasonably well. I think uh, just moving forward, the challenge is for us all to to make sure that as we sort of really pull the lever, that 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 we make sure that this round is working and working well, and that we do our part uh, collectively to make sure that, that happens, um, and and keep the relationships with all the the stakeholders and constituencies, including the GAC especially, uh, to make sure that we we can continue to evolve this thing as uh, successfully as it has over the last 30 years. Thank you. And on that note, I think we'll 
wind it up. So would you all please join me in thanking the panel? And thank you all for coming. And the moderator. And the moderator.